Thanks. I am delighted to be here and the previous speaker said age is no bar, so I am 64, so I am very comfortable. We are living in a crowded world, a world that is rapidly expanding economically. Is there room for nature? You take a look at this picture. Is there room for tigers here? This is a question on which unfortunately a lot of so-called educated people seem to have given up hope on. You see TV talking heads saying tiger is doomed, it will go extinct, it went extinct in 2000, etc. So I will share my story, my journey into the land of the tiger. But before that, let us look at it a little more analytically. We like to compare ourselves to US. But we have one third the land area, we have four times as many people and 80, 60 to 80 percent of the people depend on the land in some way, the land that wild nature requires. So these pressures are immense. On top of it, we now have a modern economy that's growing at 6, 8 or some fairly rapid rate, putting new demands on nature. What's the consequence of this? Consequence is, you see on the top left there, uh, the forest cover of India thousands of years ago and you look at the forest cover dwindling at all scales, all at the level of all India, look at the uh, Karnataka Western Ghats which is on the lower left and also a single protected area Dandeli. So this mixture of people, demands and economic growth pose a horrendous challenge to saving nature. But we need to do it and I, I was inspired to do this way back growing up in a little village near Mangalore as a schoolboy and watching tiger dancers uh, which are typical of the Mangalore district of that time. My father read me Jim Corbett stories and my aunt gave me a pair of binoculars at the age of eight and I started watching birds. And I was absolutely fascinated and it's natural, it's in inherently there in us, it's in our genes to wonder at nature. We after all evolved a hundred thousand years ago in Africa and fifty thousand years ago walked across rest of the world. Till then we were very natural, we shared nature. But the ten thousand years of agriculture and civilization have wrought, uh, broken that connection apart and I think having this connectivity to nature is very important. A lot of people think, somebody said Bengal tigers in Karnataka. No, tigers are all the same. They are the Indian tiger and it is the strongest connection we have to nature in some sense. And it is not just sentimental. You can save tigers very easily by putting one in a cage and giving it 5 kilograms of meat a day. But that is not saving nature. What the tiger does is because it is a big meat eating animal with large requirements of space, it shares its habitat with a variety of other creatures. Equally interesting, equally diverse. No, he, he just eats grass and bamboo, no steroids. That's the largest wild cattle in the world, Gaur. All this is in our backyard. What we don't realize sitting here is that we are, this is all in our backyard and we are not engaging. The largest population of Asian elephants is in Karnataka. The largest population of wild tigers is in Karnataka in India. So this is a landscape that is very diverse from the dry forest where the tiger share, shares the habitat with the sloth bear to the rainforest in the western guards where the rare lion-tailed monkey, this monkey is found only in our forest in the three southern states, western guards, nowhere else in the world, rare figs that it feeds on, incredible diversity of plants and animals and birds, snakes, reptiles, all this is sheltered in the remnants of nature and, and it is for our own good too, all the rivers major rivers originate in these forests. So it's not a question of saving the tiger, it's a question of saving a system on which our own lives depend. And in India, we are, you know, people like to come down heavily on India and trash the country quite often, particularly the middle class like to trash everybody else. So, but the point is we do have a tradition of conservation that goes fairly deeply. Many of our gods don't ride taxi cabs, they, drive uh, they ride elephants, they ride uh, tigers, they ride peacocks. This iconography in our culture, uh, nature is very deeply embedded. And that's something that gives us a start. The idea of protecting nature is not alien to us. Nature was not created for man. That's very clear to us. So, but to study nature, you have to understand it first. So, 
all this sentiment is not useful all this tradition is not useful if you don't have science at the base of it so well, but i i graduated from pre university in 1965 and engineering was the thing to do so i went and became an engineer but i hated every minute of being an engineer and gradually changed my career and formally trained myself in the university of florida as a wildlife biologist and made wildlife biology my career but i was not interested in staying in us almost all my generation who went never came back i came back here and started researching and studying tigers in india and this is a tigress called Sundari, with whom I lived for six years. My wife was jealous, but I was radio tracking Sundari for six years to understand what a tiger needs. And what it needs is one large prey a year, what kind of demands it has so that we can build a conservation around those demands. As I did my science, as I did my research, it was very clear to me from my previous occupations, which included engineering, working in a factory, selling tractors and farming for eight years. All that told me that all the science will no, go nowhere if I don't engage in conservation actively. So I recruited young people to collect data for me. I interacted with the forest department's lower staff who have the brunt of the burden. So I started building a conservation team or network using these type of people. Today it's expanded. We have more than 200 volunteers we have intensive interactions with the forest department and staff and others on ground. So whatever science we do also gets translated into action. And a lot of it is not pleasant. Uh, some of it is making the government work more efficiently. It's very easy for the, uh, for the green movement and environmentalists to sit back and criticize the government. You do need to pressurize the government. But doing that alone won't achieve, particularly in the case of conservation where 90% of the land is managed by the... So the pressures that are coming on are quite hard. There is a global trade in wildlife. This is a ch tiger that is jaw trapped and killed to supply the global bone trade. There is immense pressure from local villagers who go and kill the tiger's prey, which is as good as killing the tiger because a single tiger requires 500 prey animals to survive. So these pressures are understood through science, but they need to be solved through action, action on ground. And enforcement is a key part. A lot of people pretend that conservation of these extremely rare and valuable species can happen just by giving slideshows to villagers. Unfortunately, no. A small part of the population is criminal and needs to be deterred through force. So enforcement, efficient enforcement is necessary it's exactly like shutting down all the police stations in Bangalore is not going to make the crime go away. So that's unfortunately a key element of conservation with pressures like this. The other issue is even if you have enforcement, even if you have the best of protection and management, all the protected areas in India don't add up to more than 4% of our land. So this is a tiny fraction of the area. And there is no way by sacrificing 4% we can solve any human problems. But there are settlements inside these protected areas where people are coming into serious conflict with wildlife. It may sound romantic that you uh, share a habitat with the tiger or share a habitat with the elephant. But I have myself seen a man ma uh, mauled by a bear and his scalp torn off and had to take him to hospital and he survived. But it's uh, romanticizing this coexistence is one of the biggest banes of the modern co urbanite conservation ideas. So this conflict has to be resolved. And since you cannot move the protected areas, you cannot change the natural fauna, what we need is to take opportunities that are arising in these areas. People want education. People want roads. People want hospitals. So a lot of people actually don't want to live in these areas in these situations of perpetual conflict, as is often imagined by others. So one of the serious projects that I got involved 20 years ago was to make sure the people who wanted to move out of these protected areas were given a fair deal by the government. They got good land. They were convinced that the social forces outside would not trample on them. So for example, Mr. Muttana, who is sitting, one of our senior staff now, I hired him, he was uh, running a uh, newspaper. I made him close down his newspaper and I said, join my team. 
he has great empathy with the tribal people in Nagarhole. He keeps working with them. In this another part of the network, the man in the middle yelling at that government official is uh, D.V. Girish, who is a coffee planter from Chikmangalur, who spends 90% of his time on conservation. He went out and dealt with 450 families inside Badra Tiger Reserve, trying to convince them to move out. At the same time, I and other friends worked the system from above and from sideways and from below to make sure the money came, good land was set aside, and after a 20-year effort, 450 families moved out, and the prey numbers have doubled, the tiger numbers have doubled, and nature is coming back in Badra. But it's the people who make it matter. And it's not just scientists and bureaucrats. Religious leaders have a huge influence in India. And oftentimes, particularly if their own interests are not affected, they are willing to go on bat for conservation. And maintaining these connections is hugely important. In the end, it's a win-win solution. This man was living in the remote nowhere in Kudremukh, in perpetual conflict, and he's out there in the thriving uh, garden of his own now. His economic livelihood has improved. The housing has improved. And we are involved in edu edu educating children who have come out. They are getting education for the first time. But in the end, to me, okay, we have tried all this. One big problem with conservation in India, it's a long storytelling exercise. To me, as a scientist, without a metric, without a measure, saying I built hospitals, I gave 2,000 slideshows, it means nothing. To me, in the end, if you have invested, it has to show up in results. To me, the measure ultimately is how many tigers, what's happening to the tigers. And this is where I go back to the science, what I'm really interested in. So one of the things I developed was an accurate way of counting tigers. This was way back in 1980, and that's not a tiger. That's my assistant who is now doing his PhD in Oxford. But the technique works like this. You put automated cameras, you get pictures of tigers, and you give them ID numbers, and you get a count. Now, you have a way of counting tigers. A very reliable, accurate way. Now other people are copying it. But to me, the real interesting thing was not just that you get a count of tigers from pictures. What do you do about the tigers that are missing? That's where we use some of the most sophisticated statistical models, some of the most complex uh, sampling and estimation protocols. So, in fact, going back to the time of some formulas that were invented by P.S. Laplace in 1780 and have now blossomed into fantastic new uh, population estimation models. So we do have a phenomenal success story in some sense. When I wandered in these landscapes as a schoolboy, uh, I used to wander around my home in Puttur. I didn't see any wildlife. Then my father bought me a motorcycle so I could spread my damage. So I traveled everywhere in Karnataka wandering in the forest. Tigers were almost gone. Wildlife was almost wiped out. I'm talking of 1960s, early 60s. In the same landscape now, we have five times more tigers. Given a little protection and prey, they breed rapidly. I'm using the tiger as a symbol here. It's about nature coming back, really, not just about tigers. Given a little room, little protection, tigers are coming back. And in this landscape in Karnataka, at that point in time, there were far fewer people. Today, in this landscape, there are 12 million people. In economic growth far above that of the national average, yet there are more tigers. Yet we are not doing it all right. I am very sure if we do all the right things, we can have four to five hundred tigers in Karnataka alone in this landscape. But it, it requires an approach that's not simply rooted in the past, saying that if all, if all of us could go back to the 12th century and like we did, everything would be fine. No, everything didn't, wouldn't be fine. There were no 12 million people in this landscape. They didn't have the demands they have on now. Everybody has a cell phone. Everybody wants a hospital. Everybody wants a school. Life expectation, which was 33 years or something like that when I was young, is now 62 years in India. We have to save nature in the face of this change. Hankering for a past, romantic past, is not going to save nature. In, we have a fascination for tigers, 
we can uh, for nature but we need to recognize that economic growth and development are very much a part of conservation you cannot have conservation just saying that let's freeze everything that's not going to work because people simply won't buy it so i don't view technology science as enemies of nature conservation in fact in every country there's been a demographic shift farmers were a majority of the us population 200 years ago now they are 3% of the population this shift is bound to happen in india it's already happening it was 80 now the farming population is 80 it's about 55% now in my lifetime this shift has imposes strains on nature but it should not be viewed as a complete negative it gives opportunity for people to explore um, uh, uh, exploit economic opportunities move people off the land and actually create more sp- more space for wild nature to come back this to me is the key merging rational economic growth and development with pre- ideas of nature and this doesn't come from just going back to old tradition it comes from smart thinking now this is what i see as the future of india nature and humans together incidentally this is my granddaughter who is a student in this school and i saw this magical sight in 1994 i am sure my granddaughter when she goes up she will uh, grows up she will also see this thank you